Hello everybody, you're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rylight Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We catch up with Twangling Jack Ford over in the Yorkshed for a weekly album review. And we play local unsigned and or independent music. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I particularly want to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anybody with a story to share, local arts, news, mp3s, etc, do get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we're repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, we're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. So this week we're going to be chatting to Deirdre Waite who is a cover designer for Encircle Publications. But before we do that we're going to head over to the Rylight Zone for the latest instalment of formerly the rise and fall of a social network. So this is a novel by myself, Dane Cobain. We have been serialising it over recent weeks so if you missed an episode do feel free to go and check those out on the uh, catch up. You can also buy yourself a paperback or ebook or audiobook copy via Amazon. So, the latest installment of formerly The Rise and Fall of a Social Network. Chapter 13 It was four hours later, and I'd sobered up dramatically and settled into the beginning of a two-day hangover. John and Peter announced a day of mourning and allowed us all to go home, but most of us stayed in the office anyway. None of us had anywhere to go, and formerly was our family. We'd lost one of our own. John spent most of the morning in the boardroom with the police officers, and we watched the proceedings with a morbid interest, too distraught to do anything other than to think of our dead friend, a guy who'd been so alive and full of life just 24 hours earlier. Nothing could lighten the mood. Even Flick couldn't break the tension. Peter arrived at the office at about quarter to one. It's crazy out there, he told us. Vultures. They're still gathering them. It was a stupid question to ask. We could still hear them baying at our doors and blockading us in the office. One guy tried to climb in through a first floor window. Luckily, Flick was looking out of it at the time, and she slammed it closed just as he was pulling level. He lost his footing and fell to the floor. Peter didn't care, but Flick nearly lost her mind. She sighed with relief when he got back up again. We'd had enough bad news for the day. Of course they're still gathering, Peter snapped. We haven't released a statement yet, and the papers won't sell themselves. But what the hell are we supposed to say? Besides, we need John to sign it off. Where the hell is he, anyway? In the boardroom with the feds, said Kerry. Where have you been? Me? I had a couple of things to sort out, he replied. Thank God for Niels and his men. I wouldn't have made it up here without them. Those journalists were pressing in from all angles. How many are there? I asked. Must be a couple of dozen journos, plus maybe half a dozen policemen. We're going international, folks. I spotted CNN, the BBC and Reuters. Forget about the tech press. We're going to do what we do best, Peter replied. We're going to strengthen our servers and try to weather out the storm, but there's nothing else we can do. But what about Abby? What about him? Peter sighed. Abby's dead. It's harsh, but it's true. What do you want me to do about it? Do you want me to bring him back? My job is to make sure that Formerly doesn't die with him. You're a heartless said Flick, with tears flowing from her eyes again. She didn't cry often, but now that she'd opened the floodgates, it all started pouring out of her. He was a good friend to me, to all of us. I pulled my hood up and turned away so that my face was hidden. Truth was, I was tearing up as well, and I didn't want anyone else to see it. There was no time for weakness at formerly. Abby hadn't exactly been a brother to me, but he'd been somewhere between a friend and an acquaintance, and I'd grown to like him in a way. Things wouldn't be the same without him. I'm just doing my job, Peter replied. Perhaps it's time you did yours, Flick. You're in charge of our public image, so take charge. What are you going to do about this mess? Flick said nothing. She just flushed and leaned back in her chair as if she'd been slapped. Silence descended upon us like a dark cloud, and we all sat back in our own little worlds, just waiting for the police to leave and for John to tell us what the hell was going on. When John escorted the policeman to the door, all eyes were on him. Our uneasy silence had continued even after Flick put the radio on. We listened to it for 20 minutes or so, and then turned it off again when the news came on, in case we were on it. Well, thank you for your time, Mr Myers, one of the officers was saying. We'll be back in touch if we have any further questions. I look forward to it, John replied. Now if you don't mind, I've got a business to run. Do let me know if we can help you any further with your investigation. The officer scowled at him and said, I'd like to speak to the rest of your team. Seems to me that there's a lot of death around these parts. Now, you lot being the law-abiding gentleman that you are, I'm sure that none of you have anything to do with it. But let's suppose that one of your employees happened to know something, some minor detail, perhaps something that they don't even know that they know about. Wouldn't you want us to know so that we can find your colleague's killer? 
John reluctantly complied and introduced the officer to the team. Do what you've got to do. Folks, you're going to have to talk to the police. He sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. Flick, he said. Get me a cup of coffee, love. I need it. Sure thing, boss. While she was gone, the police officer started searching for a convenient place to interview the formerly team and John started his story. I'm sure you've all heard the bad news by now. Abby is dead. We've lost one of our own. This is a sad day for formerly, but that's not all there is to it. Foul play is suspected. He was found floating in the Thames this morning. Christ, I said. That's terrible. What happened? Apparently the cops aren't sure. They'll need to wait for the autopsy to know for certain, but I'm guessing it's nothing obvious like a gunshot or a stabbing. Hell, he could have fallen into the river on his stumble home. He wouldn't have been walking home, I told him. Not Abby, not in the middle of the night. He lived in Hammersmith. That's a hell of a long way to walk. You're right, he replied. But it's not up to us to figure that out. That's what we have a police force for. They spoke to me about his final movements. I'll be honest, last night is a little hazy, but I told them everything I could. Hell, I've got nothing to hide. Now it's your turn to do the same. No big deal. Let's make a vow. It was three o'clock in the afternoon and the formerly team was gathered around the boardroom table for an impromptu meeting. John was chairing the proceedings and it was John who was doing the talking. Maybe a vow isn't the right word for it, but I can't think of anything better. I want us all to fess up to what we were doing last night, just so there's no confusion or suspicion. You think it might have been someone at the company, boss? Flick asked. That, Flick, is exactly what I'm trying to avoid. I don't think it was anyone here, but I do think he died because of formerly. Perhaps it was a robbery gone wrong, or maybe they wanted information and he wouldn't give it to them. The office has been attacked before, so who's to say that our assailants, whoever the hell they are, haven't stepped up their game? Do you think we're in danger? I asked. Truthfully, yes, John replied. But we'll be safe in Palo Alto, and that's one of the reasons why we've taken on the complex. We're stronger when we're together. And we're stronger when we trust each other, which is why I want the truth from you all. Do we really have to do this? Kerry grumbled. We really have to do this, he said. But if it helps, I'll go first. I was here at the office. Call me crazy, but I had a feeling something bad was going to happen, so I came back to look things over and to get a few things done. Waste of time, really. I had to check over it all in the morning anyway. And can anyone prove that? Niels asked. Check the CCTV, John replied. That'll back me up. So what about you, Dan? Where were you? Cursing inwardly, but with little choice, I recounted my drunken wonderings in as much detail as I could remember. I said that I was also on CCTV, and that if anyone wanted to check my alibi, they'd have to involve the cops. I guess I'll go next, said Kerry, shifting position uncomfortably. When I left the club, I went home to bed. Looks like my life is pretty boring. No alibis, guys. I sleep alone. Speak for yourself, Peter said. Did anyone see you? A neighbour? A doorman? No one, Kerry replied. It's not like you to skip on a takeaway, Kerry, Peter laughed. Well, I guess it's my turn. I was back at John's place with company. I didn't get her name, but if I've still got a number, I can try and track her down if you want. That won't be necessary, John replied. Just make sure you change the bedsheets. What about you, Flick? Where were you last night? I... She faltered. It took her a second to pull her thoughts together. I don't remember. I remember being at the club and then somewhere else after that. Somewhere dark and quiet. I woke up this morning in the hallway outside my apartment. I guess I left my keys here. Had to walk in, in my high heels. The rest of the team shared where they were, but nothing came to light and John ordered us to get back to work as if nothing had happened. By the time I left the office, the fury of the press was reaching fever pitch. The world's journalists were gathered on our doorstep and hashtag formally was trending worldwide across multiple social networks, our own included. I'm just glad our servers can take the hammering, Peter said. Let me tell you guys a little secret. We've partnered with some good friends of mine to make sure that we're covered all over the world. We're particularly strong in America and the UK. You're never more than 80 miles away from one of our servers, unless you're in Alaska. And let's face it, no one's ever in Alaska. Things were so bad outside that Niels and his men had stopped trying to keep the entrance clear and had retreated to the inside of the building. They were keeping people out, but we couldn't exactly nip out for a pint of milk. I left under cover of darkness and descended the fire escape to try to avoid the milling crowds, but there were still a half dozen journalists lurking around the back of the building. Two of them were smoking cigarettes, and they were talking to an elderly Indian woman who looked familiar somehow. I tried to sneak past them while their intention was distracted, but they turned to look at me. Before I knew what was happening, the woman was on me like a police dog at the heels of a criminal. 
The reporters followed the two of us down the street in a bizarre conga line as she shouted at me for something that wasn't my fault. You, she yelled, jabbing a finger at me. You work for that terrible company. It's your fault that my son is dead. You must be Abby's mother, I said, still walking towards the tube station. Mrs. Desi, I'm so sorry for your loss. Your son was a good friend of mine, and I know I speak on behalf of the rest of the team when I say he'll be sorely missed. That means nothing to me, she growled. You can't bring my son back. Nobody can. He's dead. He's gone for good. Your company took him away from us, and now I have to bury my son before my husband. My grandson will grow up without a father. Who killed him? Which one of you murdered my son? Mrs. Desi, I replied, stopping suddenly and spinning around to give her my full attention. Look, we're all as upset as you are. I can assure you that if we knew anything at all about what happened to your son, we'd tell the police. Take my advice and let them do their job. If anyone can find out what happened, they can. Look me in the eye and tell me that you knew nothing about what happened, she screamed. The reporters lurking in the background were now catching the whole affair on video. I looked her in the eye. I swear to you, if I could help you then I would. Nobody's more upset than I am, but there's nothing that I can do and nothing that formerly can do either. How dare you? With a surprising strength, she spread her fingers and slapped me across the face. She hit me so hard that I still had white lines on my cheek in the morning. I heard the clicking of the journalist's cameras and felt my heart sink in the sure knowledge that the confrontation would be shown in papers across the world. Mrs. Desi, I replied, trying to stay calm in the face of insanity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. It's been a long day and I need some sleep. Her expression seemed to soften, but only a little. Her eyes were just as sharp and mournful as before. It has, she agreed. And I'm sorry too. I should have known that the drama wasn't over. In my life, nothing's ever that simple. It was dark by the time I got home, and my head was ringing with the tinnitus you get when you drink too much and don't get any sleep. I just wanted to climb into bed and to sleep until the next millennium. Unfortunately, Sarah had other plans. She was sitting cross-legged in the living room when I arrived. I knew something was wrong by the look in her eye and by the way that she flinched when I walked over to hug her. Dan, she said, we need to talk. That never sounds good, I replied. What do we need to talk about? Sarah sighed. It's about us, Dan. I can't do it anymore. I don't love you and I don't think that you love me. If you do, you're doing a bad job of showing it. I thought about protesting, but she had a point. I didn't know what to say, so I waited for her to continue. The thing is, Dan, we're growing apart. More than that, we've already grown apart. You've got your life and I've got mine. It's crunch time. I can't put my career on hold to move to America with you, and you can't put your career on hold to stay. I nodded. I thought the same thing myself, I admitted. Only I guess I've been too scared to say so. This time, Sarah nodded. She had tears in her eyes, but they were old tears, like she'd got her crying out of the way beforehand so she could maintain her composure. Thanks, Dan, she said for being a grown-up. Don't mention it, I murmured. My stomach churned and bubbled over as I wondered whether we were making the right decision, but then I realised something. It was the only decision to make. So what happens next? I'm not sure, Sarah admitted. I think we'll figure it out as we go along. But we need to take this seriously, Dan. One of us is going to have to move out of here, the sooner the better. I'll do it, I said. I'll be out of your way by the end of the week. That was the latest instalment of formerly the rise and fall of a social network by myself, Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. And this is Steve Winch and The Inception with Nitro.
I wake you from a dreamy sleep These thoughts alone are mine to keep I'm straining at the tether as I turn to face the light Imposter in a sullen face A wash with tears and out of place These scars will tell the story of ascension from the night The cross I bear will drop me to my knees The door was locked but now I'm leaving She gave me something to believe in Me feel like I felt when I was 17 Here she comes again She's got a honey crab I fell a smile and at your glycerin Here we go again She makes me feel like I felt when I was 17 Here we go again She's got cherry bomb eyes And a kiss like natural glycerin Save me from myself Save yourself from me Save me for yourself Nitro by Steve Winch in The Inception. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm joined now in conversation by cover designer for Encircle Publications, Deirdre Waite. So if you're ready to get started, the first question is one I think you'll have a good answer to. Uh, it's what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Ah, uh, oh. <laughs> Actually, that, it, it's funny. I've been saying that I've, I've, I've been so busy that... that uh, where I used to be able to name every cover design and everything that I've ever done, you know, since the 20 years I've been doing it. Now I'm having a hard time remembering what I was working on before we started talking. Uh, the last book I read was in fact in The Vanishing Hour, uh, which we just had come out by Sarah Beth Martin and I loved it. Um, I live in Colorado now, but I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts in New England. And, um, uh, I'm a bit of a witch at heart, so I love spooky stuff. I love this is why I love your books, Dane. Yeah. Um, and so it's a it's a spooky New England story. It's 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 great. It's you know, the author says, "I hope this story haunts me as much as it does you," and <laughs> it it totally did me. So yeah, so it was a good one. Awesome, and sure. the, per the perfect season for it as well. Right, <laughs> the season of the witch. Exactly. It is my favorite. <laughs> nice cool so um what can you tell us about in circle publications you, you sort of mentioned them uh, in passing there what can you tell us about the company well uh it's it's <laughs> we're a band of rogue publishers um we worked for a larger publisher for almost 20 years and um during the last administration they instituted a tax break that allowed that company to send our work to india so uh we looked at each other and said, well, we can all go get jobs or we can go all in. So Encircle got its start, technically speaking, with uh, Eddie Vincent and his wife, Cynthia Brackett Vincent. They were publishing poetry, uh, the poetry journal, The Aurorium. And so um, they started with that. They started with chat books. And uh, as our former publisher closed their mystery line, we had those authors coming to us asking about, well, can Deirdre keep doing my covers because I want them to look the same. So what if, you know, you guys helped me self-publish? Yeah. We get enough of these queries that we start looking at each other saying, well, we know how to do this. Do we just start publishing fiction? 
and we're all book lovers. You know, I mean, I've, you know, read as long as I've, you know, been able to do anything. And it was a card strongly in my family. So, um, you know, I, I grew up like you reading Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. um, that was my introduction to mystery and, and watching all the movies with my grandmother and everything. It was her book collection that I rated regularly. So, um, so that was in, well, I guess 2018 was when we started really putting books out for, for real. Um, but in 2019, when our major contract went away, we just decided to go all in and spend our time trying to put out as many good books as we could find. And, and, uh, it's been an extremely interesting ride because, you know, that ha it's happened all during the pandemic. Mm. So while I've seen other companies struggle to survive, you know, we've struggled to thrive, but we've managed to do it. So I, we've succeeded in, in publishing, I don't know, I think we're up around 150 books in, you know, four or five years. So, <laughs> awesome. you know, and it's basically four of us. Uh, occasionally we get help from, from, you know, the, the odd person here and there, but for the most part, it's four people doing everything we've got to do to try and get these books out there and, you know, we have huge faith in, in the stuff we're putting out. You know, again, we're a big fan of you, Dan, Dane, and, and mm -hmm. all of your your um, books. I, you know, you probably can't see them behind <laughs> me, but they are uh, all the uh, Encircle awesome. books I have behind me. Cool. Um, my top shelf is this year's <laughs> output. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, and uh, again, I, I hear there's another uh, late fold. I, I'm, yeah. I'm afraid I don't say it right. Yeah, no, it's it's funny with uh, all of the names in that series. I've I've deliberately chosen names that are kind of weird. So I I say Lightfold, um, and like Lightful. Miley, and then the the big one is uh, Jack Chumley, the policeman. Uh, so Chumley is like an old English surname <laughs> that looks like it should be pronounced Cholmondeley, um, and yeah, it's not for weird. That English I was going to say reasons. that's how I say it in my head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, and I, gotcha. I I I wanted to know from you. Well, as well. So you, I'm from. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I was going to say, I wanted to know from you, uh, you know, you've been in the publishing business for a while. So like, how did you get your start? And what what sort of what took you from the start of your journey in the publishing business to in circle and kind of where you are now? OK, I started with well, my first job out of college was as an inside salesperson for the tab newspaper company in Newton, Massachusetts. And so I was selling ads to pet photographers and, you know, the random pizza place and stuff that, you know, things that would come in over the phone. And um, at the time I was also a singer. So ironically, I had a lot of customers that would buy ads for me just so that they could mm -hmm. listen to me talk, which was interesting. So uh, anyway, I was really good at sales, but I hated it. So I took a job in another um, office as the receptionist, just sort of trying to take a pause, figure out what I was supposed to be doing for work because well, I knew I needed to make money. I wanted to enjoy it. So um, so sitting at the desk after about a year of being the receptionist, the publisher comes downstairs and says, we need a, somebody who knows Quirk. And I said, Quirk Express, which, mm. you know, <laughs> I don't even know if it's still around anymore. But at any rate, you know, I raised my hand and said, I know Quirk Express. And he said, well, what are you doing sitting here? Get upstairs. And so that was how my design career started. I wanted yeah. to go to art school, but I went to Stonehill College and got a business degree because that was the smart thing to do at the time. Um, and so thrived as a, an ad builder, really, really enjoyed it. I worked my way up in the company and ended up uh, on the South Shore of Massachusetts in uh, the Marshfield office eventually after being with the company for about nine years. And there I met Eddie Vincent. And so here we are, ad builders together. I'm actually mm -hmm. training the whole department on how to use a computer system because they're still doing paste up. And uh, after a few years of working together, Ed gets a job with uh, Wheeler Publishing, which was a tiny, large print publisher in Rockland, Massachusetts. And after just a short few weeks, he calls me one day and says, I have your dream job. It's kind of mm -hmm. a huge pay cut, but you'll love it. And we won't work you hard and this, that, and the other thing. He talks me into an interview. I go over there. There's six people in the company. And this is great. This is my ideal. And the job is actually to do the insides of books yeah. instead of doing, you know, any heavy design work. And so it was a nice break, a nice switch. You know, I learned some things and I learned very quickly. So they tell me, you know, big deadline problems. You know, you, we got to get stuff done real quick here. I'm like, well, I'm used to working for a newspaper company that output yeah. 126 weekly newspapers a week. So <laughs> I'm used to deadlines. No problem. 
I whip out my first pagination job in about six hours. And they said, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. You have like two, three days. And I said, well, I can read it in two, three days. <laughs> they said, go for it. So I would read and paginate, find typos, you know, deliver a perfect book. Yeah. And uh, that lasted for six months before they laid me off <laughs> because they sold the company. And so that company eventually hired Ed and I as, uh, well, Ed is an employee, me as a freelancer. And next thing I know, I'm designing book covers. You know, we got up to 50 book covers a month we were uh, designing, my husband and I. And so my husband, Christopher, he's been integral in all of this. He was the one to introduce us to computers and everything. And so yeah. um, so yeah. he was working for uh, Citizens Bank at the time. I was getting so much work, I couldn't handle it. And so I said to him, you know what? Quit your stupid job. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just go all in with this book cover thing. And so for that, uh, for the company that bought uh, Wheeler Publishing, we worked for them for about 19 and a half years. Um, well, I'm seeing my internet connection is unstable. Oh, it's all right. Um, yeah, so I can hear you fine. Is... Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, living in the mountains, it's tough. It's satellite, yeah. so... <laughs> Well, I, I wanted um, to ask. I wanted to ask you about the mountains. Actually, um, can you tell us a little bit about where you live and, and uh, some of your some of your animal friends? Because there's quite a few of them, isn't there? Yeah. The the um. So I grew up in the city. My husband grew up just south of it, and when we became serious, he let me know that. Well, just so you know, we're moving to Colorado someday. Fair enough. <laughs> I was up for living in another state. I'm I'm you know, kind of thrive on change and such. And so we were actually together a long time before, you know, we had that. Actually, it was my 40th birthday. We went to Las Vegas. We rented a Corvette. We drove out to the Valley of Fire and we didn't see another human for the entire day. And, you know, as much as I grew up in the city, I spent a lot of time in the country and that was always where I was happiest, you know, fewer people, fewer buildings, fewer everything. Um, and so in in, you know, when we were out there, we had some serious conversations and, you know, if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, what would you have not have done that you would, you know, will still regret somehow in the, you know, hereafter and, yeah. and moving to Colorado was it. So we sold our house, packed our stuff. We were already working from home. So, you know, well, while everybody else is, that's a, sort of a new thing. I've done it for 20 plus years. So, yeah. um, so we realized we could do it from anywhere. And so we packed up all our stuff and moved out here and, and uh, the ranch we bought 10 years ago this past summer. And uh, so, you know, as a kid, I loved little baby animals. And I told everybody I was going to have a petting zoo mm -hmm. someday. So <laughs> when we moved out here, I didn't think I could afford to own my own animals, but it turned out to be a much more reasonable cost of living situation than we were used to. So, um, and we don't have any kids. We That was a choice. And so um, I decided, well, you know, my part of the money that you yeah. know comes in is going to get spent on a menagerie which it does but you know it's all worth it i you know we have two horses only six goats now we used to have 15 um wow. but they're all you know they're all they've all lived super long lives my vet always tells me how awesome mm. we've done with our vet with our goats <laughs> um and we have two donkeys that are both rescues and so um you know so i do this all for them <laughs> <laughs> I say it's like me with my cat. I do everything so that I can keep him fed up with uh, with dreamies, you know. I love Biggie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell him you said hello. I'm a big Biggie fan. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. I'm here in conversation with cover designer Deirdre Waite. And this is Hounds of Magic with Astute Intuition. Guiding her life Been developing it since the age of five She's low on the radar and high in the sky Won't allow life to pass her by Her mother looks back at her boring past Staring through the bottom of an empty glass there's not many people who know she bared her charms For a penny a time at the back of the class Right. 
picked up their jobs to pursue a dream Performing the songs of Led Zeppelin Oh, what can it mean? It's in every little thing that you see Turn around, touch the ground, 99-100 Flip coin, watch it fall, 99-100 Make a move, stop, make a ring, yes or man of magic with astute intuition you're listening to the art show on 106.6 fm wickham sound i'm your host dane cobain and i'm here in conversation with deirdre wait who is a cover designer for encircle publication <laughs> um and i want to ask you a little bit about so you mentioned uh that you're also a singer and you've you know you've been doing your sort of fair share of music um you've been in some bands right can you tell us a little bit about some of those and just some of your your musical career as well <laughs> i have um, well, I started out singing in the church. I went to Catholic school in, in uh, Dorchester, um, you know, where the Wahlbergs and the New Kids on the Block came from. Um, <laughs> so, in fact, Danny Wood from the New Kids on the Block was my first kiss. That's another story. Um, so I grew up, you know, singing in the choir and stuff and, you know, eventually got disillusioned enough with all of that that, you know, that wasn't necessarily the singing route I wanted to take, but I loved singing. So, um but funny enough, it wasn't really until uh, after college, moved in with a bunch of roommates, and one of our roommates was my husband's roommate in college, and he uh, would, you know, I sing when I clean, I sing when I do everything, and so he takes me to see Tori Amos, and I'm going to the show saying, I don't know, I've heard a couple of things, she just sounds like a Kate Bush knockoff, and I'm a huge Kate Bush fan, <laughs> always have been, and so, um, but I'm like, okay, I'll go, I'll go see her. Well, you know, it was love at first sight, first listen, whatever you want to call it. But holy moly, I was completely blown away. And then I proceeded to sing her songs for who knows how long. And, you know, Gino turns to me and says, you know, you should be in a band. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> Though there was music in my family, I was always told other people go do that and make money at it. So, you know, I didn't really see it as a, a thing to do. So, um, and and so that but then ironically about uh, I don't know two weeks later a friend of mine turns to me and says hey I know these guys that are looking for a singer the singer just left and so and they need one like ASAP because they got gigs and they got recording time and all this other stuff and I'm like well, I'll go check it out I go to a tryout it's basically in their rehearsal space and you know we hit it off right off the bat you know there it was four other guys um, uh, Aaron Brian Dave and Andy and uh, you know, we hit it off music taste and all that stuff. They're huge Beatles fan, all four nice. of them. Um, <laughs> they'll appreciate that I said that. Um, but they all also had 
very different tastes for me. And so, um, so I entered a band that already had gigs set up that had recording time. It was kind of freaky and you can hear it in the first, you know, tape that we made. I'm timid and, you know, all this other stuff. And you might have figured out by now I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> um, so it's funny, the early recordings sort of make me laugh because I sound like I'm afraid of singing, or at least to yeah. me, I do. Um, but we went on, you know, we were together just a little under four years and we went on to play 150 gigs and played all over the place. We played CBGBs, we played colleges, we played, um, we were a regular staple at the Rat, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the Boston club at the time. Um, and so we were, you know, the band that sold it out regularly, you know, when they had a hole to fill, they usually yeah. called us because we were like, yeah, sure, we'll do it. <laughs> We played three nights a week and practiced four. And so, um, and, you know, and this was during my newspaper days. So, you know, I, they were kind enough to let me roll into work late a lot. So <laughs> <laughs> that was good because it was usually, usually meant late hours, of course. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we did that for a few years. And then honestly, the, we, we got, you know, this close to fame and, and that was the thing that made me go, yeah, that's the part I don't, I don't dig, you know, I don't like people I don't know coming up to me yeah. and touching me and that was happening not super frequently but a way more frequently than it had previously so um so the fame actually scared me out of the band <laughs> but they reformed and 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 so that band was called Waiting Kates um you can actually find it on it's on Spotify and yep. you know wherever YouTube the lot um and so yeah we were together from 1994 to the end of 1997, I want to say. Um, and it, it was a blast, you know, you know, living out of a van, eating tuna out of a can, you know, the whole. <laughs> uh, but it was also stressful. It was, you know, uh, my husband, Chris, and I did, you know, a lot of the work part of it. And and that made it not always fun, yeah. as you well know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to get the gigs and they want to pay you 50 bucks. And you're yeah. like, but it's going to take me days to prepare for this. So. <laughs> um so you know that that part was tough too and then I I took a long break then did a bunch of cover uh gigs with a friend Scott Bowser who's like an amazing uh guitar player and stuff and and was the kind of guy you know somebody requests something Scott knows how to play it and if he doesn't <laughs> he'll figure it out and so um we did that for a few years while I was still back in Massachusetts and then we moved out here and so weirdly I took like like three years off where I didn't even listen to music. It was kind of strange, but it was yeah. like a complete break from all sound, <laughs> you know, trying to clear my head and reset. And, you know, I just started 40. <laughs> I was flipping out. <laughs> um, but when I moved down to the ranch, you know, sure enough, in short order, I met um, some musical people and it was because of a friend here. It was his birthday. And he said, how come I hear that you've sung, but I've never actually heard you sing. And so I found out there was an open <laughs> mic night. I went and, you know, a band got up and played and they played, they played uh breakdown by Tom Petty. And, and uh, my friend Deb was playing the flute nice. and playing the, 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 the lick on the flute. And I'm like, okay, I'm, my mind's a little blown here. That's kind of cool. <laughs> so I go up and I ask him that they know Bobby McGee. They look at me like I'm nuts, <laughs> you know, and I know that look because I've hosted open mic nights. So yeah, the look said, yeah. yeah, you say you can sing Bobby McGee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, then I got up and sang Bobby McGee and blew their doors off. And I for formed two bands with those people. One was a trio and one was a five piece. The five piece did full on classic rock, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. I got to do Pat Benatar, and, oh, nice. you know, Joan Jett and, you know, those fun things. And and um, and then the trio, we did weird stuff. We would play Led Zeppelin and I would play the congas, you know, so. <laughs> awesome. Cool. And I, I want to ask blast, you. But that's basically the nutshell. Yeah, yeah. And I want to ask you, and I know you sort of struggle with this because you said you've been so busy, but um, do any of the authors that you've worked with stand out? And can you tell us about any of the authors uh, you've designed for? Oh, that's a that's a tough question. Um, I mean, they all stand out. <laughs> <laughs> we have standout authors. That's that's what we look for. Kind um, of the point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I... Would I would name yourself as one of them. I I thoroughly enjoy the Lightful books. You know, I I especially you know I have to say the short story collection might be my, my favorite because you know these little vignettes of like you know what he did to to even get where where yeah. he is where we read in the in the current books and stuff. Um, and and I I think they 
offer mystery without you know taxing people i think people yeah. are looking for you know i mean they might still want a little bit scary you know murder mystery whatever all that stuff but you know you know there's without, there's the, without the huge time in the world going on that, well, yeah it's, Right, right. It's it's nice to take a break. Well, and and not like so heavy that that you know, you, you're walking away saying, okay, well, I don't necessarily feel better for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but again, that's those are the sort of the kind of things we we try to put out there is is you know escapism and and you know because that's what reading has always been for me. I mean that yeah. at the end of the day, if I describe my job, I feel like my job is to get people to read. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I, as a younger person, you know, I had tough parts of my life that, you know, there was no escape. You weren't leaving the house. So what do you do? Dive into a book and, yeah. and, and books helped me get through lots of horrible things. And so, you know, certainly reading and, and I ended up doing a lot of the proofreading for in circle. So that's why it's tough to, to name one because yeah. I've literally read proofread like nine books in the last, I don't know how long. So, <laughs> um, but, it, but, uh, like Christopher Hawk is another one. Uh, the Chamber is is uh, uh, I I think one that you would really dig. Um, you know, it it reminded me of like, um, uh, my brain can't recall. Uh, like <laughs> one flew over the cuckoo's nest oh, kind of yeah, feel yeah. almost. But maybe not that heavy. Um, but again, it's a good creepy. You know, and and this is a good month to, to read that one. Um, Kevin Saint Jar Absence of Grace is another one that I think you would dig. Um, that one reminded me of like William Blatty and, and like the exorcist mm. and that kind of vein of horror, because it's, it's more getting into your head horror, not as well. I mean, there's some other horror in there too, but, um, but, you know, Kevin's got, you know, such a writing style. Um, uh, Matt cost, he's, you know, one prolific. Yeah. He mofo, is, he? If he I has a, every time I go on, <laughs> I say that to him all the time. It seems like every time I log into Facebook, he's got a new book out, and I'm like, "Didn't you just have one out last?" Yeah, week? he's he is like a he is that what is that word the the workman's writer like yeah. he, you know he sits down every day you know <laughs> does his job and and uh, and pumps them out and honestly he pumps them out faster than we can publish them with yeah, Lisa DePaul yeah. you know attention and stuff so um but he's got a new series coming out next year I mean he's got his main mysteries which are fun um, yeah. I love those characters and stuff they're relatable people. Um, uh, his his wolf trap is the first one series the clay wolf series um but he also writes historical fiction too which is excellent i love in a time of hate is actually right here it holds a prominent place because i love the cover so much and nice. and so um you know his his stuff is great um i'm trying to think of them all but it's, it's tough to to recall sandy manning you know these are more serious books they're they're thriller espionage but they're excellent they're like they're so well written um and you know so anyway i could go on and on and on <laughs> yeah it's, just, it's always tricky with a question like that because there's always someone that you're going to miss as well um of but course. yeah yeah so i think uh, that's pretty much all i got for you that i have one last question which is a kind of it's kind of two in one which is um you know what's next for you so what have you got planned sort of going into next year and uh, where can people go to find out more Oh, goodness. Uh, well, <laughs> we're basically racking, wrapping up 2023's schedule um, for Encircle. So I, I'm literally in the midst of just, you know, trying to set the schedule in stone. That's not always easy because stuff happens, you know, and so you got to roll with it, you know, all the time. And, and you know, we find that this is that kind of business that, you know, last year kind of went according to schedule and wasn't a big deal this year not even in the least. So, um, so we're trying to keep that in mind going into next yeah. year, but, um, but we've got, you know, we've, we've already literally got all the way through December booked and we're looking at 2024 slots now. Um, at some point we will open submissions fully, you know, right now on encirclepub.com, the, uh, the submissions says it's closed. Um, to be fair, it's a new website or, or I'm sorry, new, newly designed website and so um so we're still working out the kinks and finding all the little things because as you know like i said we have about 150 yeah. products on there so um but at some point in the near future we'll be looking for 2024 submissions um we i am also a partner and owner of golden west literary agency golden west inc um and so that is actually a whole nother story, but we've, we've just uh, brought, I think you saw on Facebook uh, to our 
to our home, uh, the massive collection that Vicki Pikarski and her husband, John Tuska, the founders, um, amassed. And it's got, you know, all the the heavy hitters from, you know, way back in the day, which, you know, they've sort of somewhat fallen out of prominence. But, you know, I mean, these guys are the Guinness World mm. Record holders for novels written, you know, Max Brand, Lauren Payne, Zane Gray, you know, these these big names. And we just got some really cool pulp magazines that haven't seen the light of day and I don't know how long and I don't know if these are the only copies you know it'll yeah. be interesting to see and and uh, but a lot of them have short stories that you know might make interesting you know streaming scripts so you know who knows where that might go um and I'm trying to make more music you know that's sort of my so I've actually moved my office to the basement in our house because in Colorado it's nice to to you know be able to be cool in the summertime at least for me yeah. and uh this gave me some space. Well, I'm actually moving into a different room down here because it, that's technically the library. So I'm going to expand into there and I can put all my instruments in there with me. <laughs> so my all of my creative tools are going to be at my disposal so I can switch gears when I need to. And, and you know, I've got some music to record. So <laughs> I'm going to awesome. try and work on that. <laughs> going to be planning to keep you busy. So then. I am on Facebook, Theodore Wait. You know, I, I, I don't necessarily accept just anybody's friendship, but... Um, but, you know, if, if you seem like we'll get along, I look for kind, nice people. <laughs> and I'm also on Instagram. You can just follow me on there. Deirdre.Wait. Big thank you to Deirdre Wait for joining me. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dave Cobain. And this is Straight 8 with their version of My Girl. <laughs>
was like my girl by straight eight you're listening to the arch on 106.6 fm wickham sound i'm your host Dane cobain and it's time for us to head over to the ilk shed now for this week's album review courtesy of twangling jack ford kaiser chiefs employment i bought this cd in a four for a pound deal in the charity shop in cozy corner in hazelmere it is another of those cds you will always find in charity shops and is well worth buying if only for the hits. In the mid noughties if you ever turned on the TV to watch a televised festival, be it Glastonbury, Reading, Leeds or V, you would inevitably catch the Kaiser Chiefs. They played well-crafted catchy pop songs and the front man Ricky Wilson, despite his girth, would be running around playing to the crowd and being a northern cheeky chappy. They were the blur of the era. This CD has some of their best known songs. Oh my God, Every Day I Love You Less and Less. And the song with the title that has become a national catchphrase, like Nice One Cyril, or It Does What It Says on the Tin. Yes, I'm talking about I Predict a Riot. The clever thing about I Predict a Riot is that until you know it well, the appearance of the phrase, I predict a riot, seems unpredictable. There are other excellent, catchy, timeless pop rock songs on this album, but Kaiser Chiefs were soon to peak. A few years later, there they were again at all the festivals. This time the crowd was chanting Ruby Ruby Ruby. Ruby 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 was massive, a -a once-in-a-lifetime crowd-pleasing song, their Hey Jude or Satisfaction. The main songwriter was the drummer, and he left to concentrate on songwriting. Ricky Wilson lost weight and became a judge on a TV singing competition show. But we now live in a time when predicting a riot is no longer a skill. Riots are almost a certainty. Kaiser Chiefs. Employment. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Deirdre Wait for being my guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I particularly want to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anybody with MP3s or a story to share, do get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we're repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts so i'm gonna leave you with one last tune and this is humans can't reboot with fading i'll chat to you next week Take the blast